If we increase the accessible space, the volume, the number of dimers goes down. If we instead decrease the volume, the number of dimers goes up. That's one example of Le Chatelier's principle that we'll look into. And of course, such an insight is really important. Imagine we were some kind of chemical manufacturers and we wanted to produce something. Marble dimers, for example. Of course, we wanted to find the conditions where we get as much of our product as possible. And that's what Le Chatelier's principle is all about. If you go to a store, you won't find a single product that has not been optimized by Le Chatelier's principle in some way. In this video, we will also look at two more examples, a change in concentration and a change in temperature. And I think especially the change in temperature example is really interesting because far beyond the principle of Le Chatelier, it can provide a sense of what role energy is actually playing in this world. And there's really a lot of confusion around that. Le Chatelier's principle states that a system at equilibrium, when subjected to a disturbance, responds in a way to minimize the effect of this disturbance. Now, I might be biased. I did my PhD in computational chemistry, but I think a simulation model is really the best way to make sense of that. So let me introduce you a bit more to my Le Chatelier simulator. In this model, all that marbles or atoms, if you like, basically can do is to randomly hop from one position to another. Now, this alone cannot teach us anything about Le Chatelier. We also need some kind of reaction. So let's say that if two marbles meet, they can form a dimer. And with some probability, dimers can split up into separate marbles again. And now that we have some kind of reaction going on in our model, an equilibrium between single marble and dimers can form. And all that's stopping us from becoming crazy rich marble dimer manufacturers is to change some of the conditions in the model and to observe how the equilibrium responds. We already saw that a decrease in volume increases the number of dimers, and that's easy to understand. For a dimer to form, the reaction partners have to meet in the first place. And that's becoming more and more likely the less space is available. The splitting of a dimer, on the other hand, doesn't really depend on the accessible space. So let's see how this fits to the principle of Le Chatelier. The disturbance in this case is the change in volume. And the effect is that it gets pretty crowded. And indeed, the equilibrium responds as if it tried to minimize this effect. The formation of dimers counteracts the crowded situation. A famous real-world example is the Haber-Bosch synthesis of ammonia, where a total of four molecules of hydrogen and nitrogen are converted into two molecules of ammonia. And enormous pressures are required to shift the equilibrium towards the side with fewer molecules. Le Chatelier himself worked on this reaction, but these attempts resulted in a terrific explosion which nearly killed his assistant. The name Haber-Bosch synthesis tells us that others had more success, but still Le Chatelier provided a lot of the groundbreaking work. Another way to influence an equilibrium is to alter the concentration of one of the involved components. Let's consider a different type of marbles, green marbles that cannot react with themselves. And the only way they can form a dimer is to react with blue marbles. And now adding blue marbles increases the number of dimers, as we can see here. And removing blue marbles reduces the number of dimers. And this is again in line with the principle of Le Chatelier. The effect of our disturbance is that it gets pretty crowded with single blue marbles. And the equilibrium responds in a way to minimize this effect. By shifting towards more dimers, it reduces the number of single blue marbles. In general, increasing the concentration of one of the reactants will push the equilibrium towards the other side of the reaction equation. The reason why this happens is very similar to the 
change in volume case. With more blue marbles around, the chance for a green marble to bump into a blue marble and consequently to form a dimer is increased. The chance for dimers to split, on the other hand, is hardly affected by the number of blue marbles. In practice, this is especially interesting if one of your reactants is very cheap. For example, if one of your reactants is water, you might want to add a large excess of it to make sure that your other, more expensive components are used as efficiently as possible. Finally, let's add energy to our considerations to understand the influence of temperature. Let's assume that two marbles forming a dimer is an exothermic reaction. So when a dimer is formed, it's initially rich in energy. And I show that as a vibrating dimer. In the next step, the dimer can donate its unit of energy, shown as a glowing dot, to other marbles or dimers. And for a dimer to split up, it now first has to acquire a unit of energy necessary to break the bond between the two marbles. And just like marbles move randomly, the units of energy can now also hop randomly between adjacent marbles or dimers. Additionally to the grid where our reaction takes place, let's add a hot and a cold grid acting as heat baths. In the hot grid, a lot of energy is roaming around and in the cold grid, no energy is present at the beginning. And now we can bring our reaction grid into contact with either heat bath. And this allows energy to travel between the grids. Upon contact with the hot grid, energy tends to flow into the reaction mix, allowing for dimers to split. And the number of dimers goes down. Upon contact with the cold grid, energy is drained from the reaction mix, it becomes less likely that dimers encounter the necessary energy for them to split. The number of dimers goes up. This again agrees with Le Chatelier's principle. When we heat something up, the effect of our disturbance is that energy becomes more abundant. To minimize the effect of this disturbance, the system would have to absorb some of that energy. And that's exactly what we can see in the simulation. Heat favors the endothermic reaction, the reaction that absorbs energy. On the other hand, if we cool the system down, the exothermic reaction, the one that releases energy, is favored. What I think is so interesting about this last example is that back when I studied chemistry, we learned about reactions driven by statistical effects, by entropy, and reactions driven by energy, as if they were two completely different things, as if the statistics would somehow compete with the energy. And at least I never really understood how these two things could somehow go together. The last model helped me to understand that ultimately something that is energetically favored is just entropically favored in a different way. The reason low energy states tend to be likely in the first place is because the energy that is not bound in them can lead to a large variety of states somewhere else. It's a statistical reason. Energy is not something that can magically make things happen. Just like the number of atoms, it's another thing that stays constant and is moved around. It is the statistics that do all the heavy lifting. 